All right, you got the recording? Yep. Cool, awesome. Hi everyone. Um, welcome to the fourth week of Fundamentals of Blockchain. As always, would love to see your faces if you feel comfortable turning on your camera. If you can't, I understand. Um, today, Nathan and I will be walking you through some of um, a little bit more detailed parts of Bitcoin. Um, Nathan will be talking about different types of wallets, which I know a lot of you guys are interested in decentralized finance. So um, this is a good lecture to listen to for that. And then I'll talk about mining, which is like, as we all know, this huge buzzword that um, isn't exactly what it sounds like. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. A couple announcements before we start. Um, so we're going to be adding an extra lecture on May 6th. I say extra because it won't be required because, you know, we've already finalized our lecture list for this semester. Um, but um, some of the people in the education department here at Blockchain at Berkeley are going to cook up some really cool topics related to blockchain technology. Um, PhD students, like it's going to be very interesting. I really recommend everyone come, but we're not going to require it for this course. So it'll be considered extra credit if you attend. Um, if you miss a quiz or two, you know, just come to that lecture and hopefully it'll make up for the missed points. And then the second item is about um, this club called Encode Club. And they're hosting a couple of events for blockchain beginners that we thought some people in this decal might be interested in. So we're gonna have a B courses announcement later on about that. But just to give you some dates, if you wanna know, you know, one of these events happening, there's one tomorrow, one March 2nd and one March 4th, but we'll have an announcement up for those. So you can, you can see if you wanna attend. And this last thing um, is about our first discussion assignment. If you've looked at our syllabus online, um, we have these weekly quizzes to gauge attendance, but we also will have three discussion assignments throughout this semester. And so our first discussion assignment will be posted after today's class. And Nate can talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, so this week's first discussion, the way it'll work is it'll be just a standard B courses discussion in terms of how you get credit for it. So all it is is just write a little paragraph. And I think this week is on a use case. And I know so far we've mostly only talked about Bitcoin, but we'll be, this will give you an opportunity to explore the world of blockchain a little bit more and dive into a specific use case of your choice. So all you'll do is write a little paragraph um, on the discussion tab, which you'll see pop up after lecture at eight o'clock. And then you will comment or respond to two other people's posts. And then that will give you full credit. Yeah. Super, super chill. We just want to see you guys are thinking about these topics outside of this class, and it gives you a little bit of creative um, freedom to talk about any sort of protocol you want. Uh, awesome. All right. So then, as I said, um, I'll be your lecturer if we want to go to the next slide. Um, for Nathan and I will be your lecturers for today. Um, this is the basic overview. Uh, we are going to go over the types of users in the Bitcoin network. We're going to go over the different types of wallets you can use, the mechanics of those wallets. Um, and Nathan will be going over all those and then I'll get into mining and what mining actually looks like today. Cool. Yeah, I'm all there. I'm one of your, your course coordinators. Nathan, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, I'm Nathan. I'm also in the education department at Blockchain Berkeley and I'll be your second lecturer. So how about let's get started. So first, let's talk about types of users that might want to use Bitcoin or any other blockchain. Um, not every client is a miner because most people don't have the space or the money to buy a powerful computer to mine blockchain, and not everyone wants to spend the time mining blockchain. Yeah, so not every client could download the entire blockchain because many devices don't have enough storage space to download the entire blockchain. For example, if you want to send Bitcoin with your phone, it will be impractical for you to download the entire blockchain because most phones don't have 280 gigs of memory. And not every client is directly connected to the network because if you're not making regular transactions, then you don't need to communicate with the network daily, which could take up a lot of bandwidth. And not every client has a wallet because they could be using another service as their wallet. Um, full nodes are usually what's used by miners and people who are more connected to blockchain, but most people would not need a full node. So the solution that Satoshi came up with was night nodes, light nodes, or SPV nodes, which stand for simple payment verification. And it's just a method of verifying if a particular transaction is in a block. It only looks at the header of a block 
and it keeps track of only the transactions of the users. And they're also called lightweight clients because you only need to download the entire blockchain. So it's kind of lightweight in that sense. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so let's talk more about simple payment verification. So then the assumption is that incoming block headers are not from a false chain because false chains are relatively unlikely in the grand scheme of things. And long-term the chain is probably honest because there are usually more honest users than dishonest users. You can't really afford to put your entire blockchain on the phone again. So having a thin client is a decent trade-off. So what happens is that you connect your node to a full node, which you assume to be accurate. And then you just examine the Merkle root to check if your transactions are in the blockchain. Any questions? Mm, yeah, I guess we'll move on. So let's talk about wallets. So what are wallets? To secure our identity, we need to secure a private key, which is kind of like our password. For example, you don't want people getting your Facebook, your email passwords, because there'll be a lot of private information on there. This is even more important for blockchain because it's, it's money that you're trying to secure. So how do we manage all of our private keys? We use a wallet. So an address is similar to your username. A private key would kind of be like the password but then they're a lot more obscure and harder to break. So what do wallets do? They, first of all, they provide a user interface for the, to the blockchain because not many people have the technical know-how to fully interact with the blockchain. So it's good if you have some interface between the user and the blockchain. Keeps track of your private keys and stores, sends, receives, and lists transactions on your behalf. Might have some other fancy functionality to set apart from other wallets, but a wallet is a pretty simple concept as a whole. Mm, yeah, so let's talk about some wallet types. If you want to know more, you could go on this website. Um, the slides will be posted, so, so um, you could check it after this lecture. So then there's two main types of wallets. It's either the hot wallet or the cold wallet. Hot wallets are hot because they rely on the internet, which is another layer of vulnerability because it's easier to break into a wallet if you are connected to the internet. But cold wallets are not connected to the internet, which is better because they're more secure, but then they're harder to use. And they're usually much simpler too. Like a brain wallet is literally memorizing your public and private key. And your paper wallet is just writing everything down. And then, PC wallets that you, you might have heard of uh, are Coinbase. There are apps like Edge that work as well. Um, yeah, so hot wallets use internet, which makes them a bit more vulnerable. Um, so Coinbase, Bitcoin Core, Bitcoin itself, these are all hot wallets. Cold wallets don't need the internet. So like paper wallets, there's hardware that you could use that's disconnected from your computer, which you could use to sign transactions and store your public key. Um, and there's also brain wallets where, where you just memorize your private key. Um, yeah, so let's talk about cold storage wallets. Cold storage wallets are a device that's disconnected from your computer. You could use it to store your private key and you also use it to sign transactions. There might be some other features based on how fancy it is, but it's mostly just a device to keep your private key safe. Paper wallets. So then a paper wallet is pretty much as simple as just writing down your private key and public key. You can scan it with a QR code. And yeah, if you have a paper wallet, you need to keep it safe. So because if people find it, then they know your private key and public key. And brain wall wallets, pretty much you're memorizing your public key and private key. And a good way of doing that is having a mnemonic of words and phrases. So then you can use the first letter of each word to generate your private key. 
Um, so it's easier to have something that you could memorize because memorizing a sequence of letters and numbers is pretty hard to do. But then this may not be very secure because humans aren't as random as we think we are. So if a hacker knows your behavior patterns, then they might be able to, to break your brain wallet. So yeah, here is how brain balls work. You, you, you memorize these words and somehow they hash into this private key. And the good thing about brain wallets is that even if you forget the private key and you remember the words, you could just try many combinations of the words until you get the private key. So it's not as hard to forget. And yeah, the trade-off between hot wallets and cold wallets are security for the cold wallets, but hot wallets are definitely more convenient because you don't have to memorize anything and they're just a lot easier to use. Uh, yeah, yeah, creating a ultra brain wallet and skipping the mnemonic step. Yeah, if you have a big brain, um, I know some people, they can memorize their entire private key. If you could do that, then good for you. Um, any questions? Yeah, I got a question for you. Yeah. So I'm curious about hardware wallets. Um, do yeah. they happen to build them with fail safes in the event of any malfunction? Um, yeah, I believe that they usually have fail safes because they're supposed to be super secure. And in case of any malfunctions, they, they probably don't want other people to find the key. So I'd assume there are. But there's many different implementations of hardware wallets. So they probably implement it in different ways. Thank you. Nathan, have you memorized your public and private keys? <sighs> I use Coinbase. Uh, but I've been trying to, I've been working on it, you know. I've, I've definitely, I've been working on it. Big brain, big brain moves. It's funny, I, I send my like Zoom meeting ID out now. So now, and it's like a random set of numbers and letters or numbers. And so yeah. now I've actually started to memorize it because I send it to so many people <laughs> that I just, I type it all out instantly. So yeah, I thought about this lecture when we, when I've been doing that. Yeah, because dude, I had trouble memorizing my Cal ID until, I, until like the beginning of sophomore year. My memory is not very good. <laughs> yeah, Coinbase does suck. Yep. Yeah, not as bad as Robinhood. Not as bad as Robinhood. Um, yeah. So let's talk about acquiring Bitcoin. So how do, would we get Bitcoin? Um, yeah. Just like regular money, there's ATMs for Bitcoin. Um, if you're in Berkeley, you could get Bitcoin from these ATMs. Oof. Yeah, you, you could go to these ATMs. They're all near Berkeley, which is good. Um, some pros are that they're very simple to use. They're available, so then you could use it whenever you want and instant, so you don't have to wait for them. Wow. Um, yeah. Now let's talk about exchanges. There's two main types of exchanges. There are centralized and decentralized exchanges. Sorry. Um, so then centralized exchanges are kind of like trading different types of money um, on the airport. You, you just trade between different types of currencies. Centralized exchanges are easy to use. And, and they're supposed to be secure. Decentralized exchanges are usually more secure because they're anonymous. And also it's harder for you to hack it because there's no central database that the exchange relies on. Trades are person to person. And some examples are BISC, Uniswap. A big one is SushiSwap. And they're also trustless because you don't have to trust the other person to trade money. Usually how it works is that each 
exchange would mint a token, which represents a certain amount of some sort of fund, some sort of token, like some sort of currency. And you, you trade the currency for the token, which you, and then and then it goes into a single pool, and then you can trade token to get the currencies that you want. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so decentralized exchanges are more secure, but centralized exchanges are more convenient because centralized exchanges tend to be easier to use, while decentralized exchanges, you, you're anonymous and there's no single point of failure. Any questions? Let me look at the chat. Michael's story about Coinbase is pretty wild. If you want to. Yeah, <laughs> I saw that. Wait, what's SIM swapping? OK. Um, well. I used to be using Coinbase a lot, but I've switched now to Uniswap because, yeah, it kind of happened because I was in the whole Wall Street bet thing. And then, yeah, I got screwed over by Robinhood. So, yeah, I've been moving my money away from centralized exchanges like Robinhood and Coinbase. <clears throat> yeah. But, yeah, like centralized exchanges are definitely easier to use, but then you're more at mercy to like the person in charge. Ooh, yeah, that's definitely a problem because Ethereum is going up. So then the all, yeah, the, the token is based on Ethereum. So then gas fees are pay. Yeah, Robinhood sucks. Yeah, invest in Bitcoin. Yep. So then let's do an exercise. Let's create a wallet. Um, yeah, so go on this website, walletgenerator.net, to create a paper wallet. Um, if you use, if you have MetaMask, use a browser without MetaMask because MetaMask won't let you access this website. Nathan, do you want to go through the site and show? Yeah. Or I don't know, but you can do it and present at the same time. Yeah, let me do that. Pretty cool, because I feel like I feel like we talk a lot about like private and public keys and, and wallets, but actually being able to work with the numbers um, yeah, let me helps you see it better. Okay, perfect. Okay, wait a sec. Um, and I I sent the link in the chat so anyone can go. Yeah, on got it, got it. Okay, so then the first step is just moving the math around to create some randomness to generate our private key. And yeah, there we go. Here's our wallet. Um, you can generate a new address if you choose the currency. You can print the wallet. Um, paper wallet. So here is the paper wallet that you can use. Here's a bulk wallet. Oops, sorry, that, that was the other um, lecture. And then brain wallet. So let, let's try that. Let's make a password. You're not gonna show us your password? Sure. No, you don't have to. It's, fine. it's all good. All good. Oh, very nice. All good. Um, okay, let, let, let's make it longer. I'm scared. This is Nathan's um, real password. And now we all know. Yeah, it. I'm sorry. I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> really bullied Nathan into showing us his password. Yeah, I'm going to have to change it after this lecture. <laughs> Yeah, so now we have a public address and a private key. Yeah, Nate, um, you, you want to memorize that? Yeah, I got it. Yeah, you got it. 5JR, 
Pm to n by Qp. Yeah, let's look at the details of the wallet. Public key. Yeah. Um, did everyone make a wallet yet? Oh, you can print it out and fold it too. That's pretty cool. So it's, it's an actual wallet. I think I think a bulk wallet, Michael, is just um, a collection of different addresses, so you can store it in one place. Um, if Nathan, if you want to go to the bulk wallet, yeah. Oh, you just. Okay. Anyways, um, if you look at it, it's just, it says it's like it has the index of like what number um, wallet that is and then the address and then the private key for that account. So if you have a bunch of different wallets, it's just easy to keep it in one place. All right. Um, do we want to make the next wallet? So here, we're going to create a hot wallet. MetaMask actually trusts it, even though it's supposed to be less secure, which is interesting. Um, let's go to blockchain.com wallet. Let's create, you can create your own exchange account too, if you want to try after lecture. Let's create the wallet. Um, yeah. Yeah, so then you, you could make your own blockchain wallet. You could also do it on your phone if you want to. And you just wait a bit. And yeah, you, you want to verify your email. So this is pretty much just making another account. As you can see, it's probably less, um, Secure, but it's definitely a lot more convenient because you can even buy Bitcoin if you want to try that. And yeah, Bitcoin is almost like 50K. Ethan. Okay. Um, I think it depends on the hot wallet because usually if it's run by another company, then like Coinbase, they definitely take some, they definitely take a cut, but then Coinbase doesn't take as much as Uniswap does, at least right now. Hmm. Oh, Rick, wait. Okay. Wait, Brian, do you get into my Cal Central? <laughs> okay, okay, good, good, good. Almost a heart attack there. Yeah, um, should, should we move on? 
<laughs> yeah, let's move on. Yeah. That was a mistake. I changed all my passwords. Okay. Yeah, so then that's just how it looks like. And if you were able to successfully make an account, that's what you'd get. Um, you could also send and receive Bitcoin, which makes it a lot more convenient than using a cold wallet because you can't do it with a piece of paper or just memorizing your private key. Questions? Nathan, you're lucky that you have two-step verification on your Cal Central. That's all I'm saying. No, it wasn't happening about my password. Yeah. Hey, Nathan, I got another question for you. Yeah, yeah what's up? Are you familiar with MetaMask? Do you use it? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you know why uh, Bitcoin isn't allowed to be stored? Uh, uh, Bitcoin is not allowed to be stored on MetaMask? Yeah, the keys can't be stored on. Uh, yeah, because like MetaMask be isn't Metamask. very secure. It's a browser extension on Chrome. So then it's pretty easy for someone to hack into it. It's, it's kind of right. like a hot wallet without sense. a security procedure. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I didn't want to risk the liabilities. So yeah, let's move on to the next section. I'm just going to talk about more of how wallets work in general. Yeah, so then one cool feature of wallets is called multi-sig, which, which just delegates um, multi-persons to have a certain key. So in the regular Bitcoin address, each account has one key. But then in the multi-signature address, there are multiple signatures needed, which is kind of like um, if you've taken CS70, kind of like SHA ha hashing. Yeah. So yeah, you'd be familiar with it if you took CS70. So then if you have like five signatures, you need three out of five. And this is really useful when it comes to Bitcoin. Um, so then what happens is, let's say that Rusty has a wallet, but then he, he gives three keys to Justin, Janice, and Oscar. And if you have two keys, then you could open the wallet. So then each of them, they can't open the wallet, but then if two of them went together, then they could open the wallet. Let's say you needed four keys, so then none of them could open the wallet. And Rusty had, so and there were seven keys in total, so Rusty had four, and they each had three. So in that case, even if they group together, they wouldn't be able to open the wallet, but Rusty would be able to open it. If for some reason Rusty lost one of his keys, then he could ask either Justin, Janice, or Oscar to loan their key so he could open his wallet. Um, you can see this in use by companies like Coinbase and stuff, where they might take one or two keys because they won't be able to access your wallet. But then if you lost one key, you could call Coinbase and they could help you recover your wallet. Um, yeah, some best practices. Yeah, don't be like me with my passwords. Um, never reuse your public keys because someone should never determine how much Bitcoin you use. Keys are easy to generate anyway, and wallet software should handle this. So then when you have a wallet, you should be able to generate keys. Let me talk about HD wallets or hierarchical deterministic wallets. They're deterministic because all keys are generated from a seed in the same way every single time, usually through a mathematical hash function, which should give you the same answer every time you run it. It's hierarchical because you could organize the keys in this tree-like structure. So what happens is you have your seed, you hash it once for your master, and then you keep hashing it to have your child keys. And then you also have your extended public key, which you could hash again to get, which makes it easy to determine your keys because you just hash it through different hash functions each time. Um, that's good because there are fewer points of failure because you could store and back up one master private key and then you write an entire tree of child keys. So pretty much the only point of failure is your master key. 
So you only need one key to open all your wallets. And then this is also good because even though the owner could have everything, um, if the owner wanted someone to only have one branch of it, let's say this branch, he could only give him this key and the guy would be able to access all of these, but not everything because he doesn't have the master key. Um, yeah, so let's talk more about HD wallets. So you start with a master private key and you can generate child private keys by hashing the private key plus the index of each of the wallets. And you use the master public key of the master private key to generate rate all the child public keys. And by the nature of hash functions, as I said, then the same inputs will always give the same outputs. So you only need one key to generate everything because the outcomes are very predictable. Yeah, any questions? So cool. is this how, oh, sorry. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so is this how um, the public key is derived from the private key? Um, usually, yeah, usually. But then you can set your own public key because the public oh, okay. key, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's good. It, it's done like that a lot, but it doesn't have to be. Mm, cool. Yeah. So Ava would begin our next section on mining, but let, let's take a break first for about five minutes. Yeah. We'll come back around 646 and I'll start. Thank you, Nathan. No problem. Sorry, right, my screen's being weird. Can you see the slides? Because I cannot right now. Not yet. I'm going to. Uh, thank you for that, Nate. Um, all right, it's 646. So hopefully most people are back. Um, we have fans going crazy right now. All right, so now I'm gonna go over mining. Um, you've definitely heard this term a ton. And if you're like me, like you had this image of people like in a cave with like pickaxes and it didn't make sense to me at all. Um, so we're gonna go over the actual details of mining in Bitcoin. And this is kind of just the process that we ensure um, that the Bitcoin protocol is being executed well. It's how we introduce new Bitcoin into the network. Um, and it's, it's the basis of everything that we've gone over from distributed ledger to decentralization, all those buzzwords um, stem from this idea of what mining is. Um, so we came up with this recipe for mining that kind of distills it in a nice way. Um, and so to be a full-fledged Bitcoin miner, you must first download the entire history of the blockchain. Um, then you must verify incoming transactions then you'll create a block. Then if you're able to find the valid nonce, and this deals with the proof of work that we discussed um, in previous lectures. Um, so this is expanding that computational power. And this is this step four is kind of what distinguishes like who gets to um, mine the next block. Um, it's who's able to find the valid nonce. Um, and we'll go over what a nonce is. Um, and then step five is broadcasting that block to everyone else. So you can say, hey, look at this. I found this block. You should add this to your blockchain. And then the last step is receive your profit. So, um, okay, I'm not going to be looking in the chat. So if anyone has any questions, Nate or Nathan, hopefully, or someone else, we'll be able to tackle those questions. Um, okay. Uh, why is my computer being weird? Okay, cool. All right, so the first step is downloading the history of the blockchain. So you need to get blocks from your peers in order to see what blocks have been added in the past, starting from the Genesis block, which is the very first block on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and then you're going to stay up to date. So if you ever get broadcast, um, someone's like, hey, look, I found this block. It's in your best interest to check it, make sure it's um, everything checks out and then adding that to your blockchain um, to make sure that you're always mining on the longest chain um, and not you know, missing out on something that's happening. Um, by not adding and updating constantly. And the second step is to ver verify transactions. Um, and so you're gonna be 
using this mempool, um, which is a term that refers to pending transactions that might be broadcast towards you. And so if you want to, you know, make a transaction on the Bitcoin network, you'll send it to some people and those people will send it to some people and those people will send it to some people and miners in the network are going to be saving those unconfirmed transactions in their mempool. And so when, when and if they mine a new block, they will grab from that mempool of transactions, um, verify that they're, you know, there's nothing fishy happening with any of those transactions, uh, make sure that those transactions check out and then they'll add those into their new block. And so a question a lot of people have is if there are, let's say, 5,000 transactions sitting in, in a mempool at any given moment, and on average, there's around 2,000 transactions in a, um, in a block in Bitcoin, then how does the miner decide which of those transactions to keep and which of those transactions um, not to include in the block? And this is done through transaction fees, which we'll get into in more detail later. But essentially, on top of the block reward that miners get, from mining a new block, they also get a little cut of any of the transactions that go through um, and that they choose to add into their block. And so if there's a higher transaction fee on any given transaction, they're gonna be more incentivized to include that transaction. Um, third step is creating a block. So in order to create a block, we wanna collect those transactions into Merkle trees, and then we're gonna store the Merkle root in our uh, block. And so you went over this in the last lecture, it's pretty technical. Um, so I won't go into it in great depth, but we're going to choose the transactions, like I said, that we want, depending on transaction fees, um, grab the previous block hash, um, which we have because in order to be a full fledged miner, we need to download the whole history of the chain um, and other necessary data in order uh, to build that block. And then once we've put all that together, we move on to step four, which is, like I said, this is this is kind of the major step here, which is finding a valid nonce. Um, and a nonce is a term that's just used for like a, a random number that we need um, in, in a step in a cryptographic um, procedure. And so in this situation, a nonce is this uh, number that needs to be below a target number that's given to you by um, the Bitcoin network. And in order to find this nonce, um, like this like totally random arbitrary number, um, that we use because it is computationally difficult to find. And so we are ensuring that miners are expending um, computational power in order to find this number. Um, once you find the correct nonce and the way that we, here I have it right here, the way that we determine the correct nonce, I think, so I, I added the slide because um, when I was going over mining, I remember I wanted to like actually see what we were talking about. And so this was the current target when I made this slide, it's for sure changed now, but this is the essentially like what a target looks like. And so there's these, um, however many number of zeros and the more number of zeros at the beginning of the target um, is directly correlated with how difficult the, the target um, nonce is gonna be to find. So, because this is just making the number smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so you're gonna have to find a number that has that many zeros at the beginning, um, followed by, you know, whatever, to make sure that it's below uh, the target number and that's gonna be your nonce. And so once you find that nonce, if you find that nonce um, that's below that target number, you'll add it into your block. Um, and then, so this is kind of just like showing you like, it, there's no like special math algorithm or anything that you can do to find this nonce um, faster or easier than anyone else, which is part of the reason why Satoshi had Bitcoin built this way because it is a, direct function of just like randomness and I guess computational power to a certain extent, but um, no one has a better chance of finding this than anyone else. Granted, they have the same um, equipment. So once you find that nonce, that's step four, um, you can move on to step five, which is broadcasting it to the network. So Janice, let's say Janice was a lucky one to find that nonce. She'll tell me and Nathan, she'll say, look at this new block I found. She'll tell Nate and Yi, and I was working on it. Um, but so I'll see Janice's block and be like, dang it, you know, you beat me to it. Um, but we'll all check it out. Nate's going to check if the transactions are valid. Nathan's going to see if the block header is less than the target. Yi's going to see how much mining reward is attached. Um, and so we're all going to make sure that, you know, this is, this was created um, like with integrity and Janice didn't mess with the block at all. 
Um, and then, so I'm pretty pissed, right? Because I was trying to work on that block. But like I said, um, it's not in my best interest to not accept Janice's block because um, the assumption is that the rest of the network will if it's if it's a proper block that was that was mined um, correctly. And then if I don't accept Janice's block, I'm just going to be left behind. I'm going to be mining on a shorter chain than everyone else. And so, <laughs> and so any blocks that I find, let's say if I do find one on that chain, won't be accepted by the rest of the network because it's going to be shorter than theirs. So um, that's something to keep in mind for why miners are incentivized to accept blocks when they receive them, if they're if they can verify that all the work on them is is good. And so there goes all my work. Okay, all of us add it, add it to our chains once we um, see that everything checks out. Nate says no time to waste. Let's try again um, because you kind of just got to move on and try to find that next block. Um, this last step is profit. So like I said, mining is a competition. Everyone's competing to find the next block and the longest chain rules. Um, and so you wanna make sure that if you're, if you create a transaction that that block is on the longest chain because the longest chain is how we determine which um, chain that we're gonna be working off of. Cause at any given point in the network, there will be different people, um, you know, with slightly different length chains. So we always assume that that longest chain um, has the most computational power put into it. It has the greatest proof of work. Um, and so that's, that's the chain that we, that we're going to assume like is the right one. Um, and then, you know, like I said, the block reward and the transaction fees are, is how miners receive profits. Um, and so that's, what's, that's, what's incentivizing them to continue to compete. All transactions are stored. Um, as part of the transaction history. And if you're not included in the longest chain, then your block may have not been the first valid block that was seen by other people. Someone else may have find, found a valid block before yours. And that just brings me back to like, Nate, in this picture, no time to waste, let's try again. So if your block is not on the longest chain, like that really sucks. Um, that just means someone else found a block before you and they were able to broadcast it to more people in um, that amount of time. And so you just gotta, you know, move on to the next, can't cry over it. Okay, any questions on this first part about mining? All right, um, I'll move on. Feel free to, again, send in the chat and I'll stop for questions, I think, a couple more times. Okay, so what are the incentives behind mining? Why should someone do all of this work um, for the Bitcoin network. Um, and like I said, the main incentive is profit. I'd say that's that's a big one here. Um, miners are incentivized by the block reward um, and transaction fees, like I said, to continue to mine on the network. And it's a lot of profit. Wow, my slide lagged and it was supposed to, that was supposed to be the synced up. Anyways, it's a lot of profit. Um, like we said here, so that's like the major incentive um, for why someone would mine. Um, this is pretty straightforward, but profit is equal to revenue minus cost. And so if revenue is greater than cost, then you're going to get a profit out of that. Um, and so this is where we break down exactly mining incentives. And, and I think this is a little bit more when we get into the game theory behind it of how we know that miners are acting honestly, how we know that they're going to continue to mine on the network, how, why are they incentivized to do so. Um, and so mining revenue is broken down into their block reward plus transaction fees. And the cost of mining is broken down into fixed costs and variable costs. And we'll get into which costs are fixed and which costs are variable. Um, and basically, if mining revenue is greater than that mining cost, so if block reward and transaction fees are greater than the fixed cost plus the variable cost, then the miner is going to get profit. So we'll start off with the block reward. Um, I've referenced this a lot, but we haven't talked exactly about what that block reward is. Um, and essentially, the miner will receive Bitcoin for every confirmed block um, that they put uh, onto the chain. And so right now, that block reward is 6.25 Bitcoin per block. Um, and the way that the miner receives that amount in Bitcoin um, is that when the miner is putting together the block, putting together the Merkle tree, the first transaction on the Merkle tree is called the Coinbase transaction. Um, and that's like a special transaction to themselves, um, which is incentivizing honest behavior, um, right? Like you're incentivized to make this block an honest block so that other miners on the network will accept it. Um, 
because if you don't, then like you're losing out on your 6.25 in Bitcoin, um, which is something like a crazy amount right now, like $300,000 right now. Um, so <laughs> if you want to ensure the fact that you're going to make out with $300,000 at the end of this trend, at the end of this, like creating this block, then you want to make sure it's honest so that other people will accept it as well. And so that's another way that, that the network um, incentives align with the individual incentives. Um, and so this value of 6.25 halves every 210,000 blocks. And so if you've heard of like Bitcoin halving or whatever, um, this is where that stems from. Every 210,000 blocks, the value of Bitcoin that is mined per block cuts in half. And so the next, uh, the next time we hit 210,000 blocks, it's gonna be 3.125 and so on and so forth. And um, if you see this graph depicts it pretty nicely where we're gonna have this asymptote as we approach 21 million Bitcoin. And like, that'll be around 2140 is the current estimate um, given the amount of house power in the network. Um, and so we're gonna, we're gonna end up at around 21 million Bitcoin. And so um, we're given right now what we've gone over so far that profit is a primary motivator behind mining. Um, there's a higher incentive to be honest than to be not dishonest, um, which creates a more secure network. Um, and since the network is pseudonymous, there's no way to effectively punish dishonest behavior. And so it's super important that these incentives are built into the network <coughs> in this kind of like game theory way. We have a whole, we have a whole lecture on that that's coming up soon. And so the conclusion here is to reward the honest nodes um, and proof of work ensures that miners are dedicated to the network. Um, so I think in an earlier lecture, we went over this, um, how miners stay committed to the network through proof of work. Um, they're proving that they're willing to pay money, electricity, and hardware just to earn Bitcoin. Um, so it's a pretty, it's a pretty solid plan. Um, and so here's a here's a pretty big question: How are miners incentivized to be honest in their mining? We've we've said that the incentives are aligned, but why isn't it in their best interest to just mine an empty block? Um, to just you know include that first Coinbase transaction. Um, I know Coinbase is the name of the exchange, but they got their name Coinbase from this transaction, which is the first transaction in any given block where the miner sends 6.25 Bitcoin to themselves. Um, and so why isn't the miner incentivized to just do this, just put in 6.25 Bitcoin and then broadcast that block to the rest of the network um, without putting anyone else's transactions? Um, and the answer is that mining revenue is two parts, right? It's block reward, but it's also transaction fees. And so if they were to mine a completely empty block, they'd be losing out on a lot of profit that they'd receive from transaction fees. And so um, when you input, um, like we went over the UTXO model, when you input, let's say five Bitcoin, and I wanna send three to Nate, one to Nathan, um, one to Janice um, and whoever, and there's a bunch of these output blocks, whatever is what the, diff the difference between the input and the output and the sum of all the outputs, is equal to the transaction fee. And so that's gonna go directly into the pocket of the miner. Um, and the transaction creator, so whoever's sending this, these UTXOs sets that fee. And that fee, like I said, can be set just by the difference between the inputs and the outputs. It's not required. You can create a transaction um, without a transaction fee, but it's pretty much necessary because you can assume that other um, users on the network will be including transaction fees and your transaction will just not be included in any block because every single miner will include other transactions over yours because they have zero to gain um, from adding your uh, specific transaction to the block. Um, and so this transaction fee just acts as an extra income for miners on top of their block reward. So you can kind of think about it like the higher the transaction fee, the faster your transaction will be confirmed because the more likely any minor in the entire network will pick yours up first because your transaction fee is higher than everyone else's. Um, and so they're going to receive a pretty high profit from that. And um, like I said, transaction fee is equal to input minus output. So you have to sum all those outputs, <coughs> subtract it from the input, and that'll be the transaction fee. And this is really important because this is a popular question. I think someone asked this as well in the first lecture. When the block reward goes to zero, why will the Bitcoin network continue to function? Won't all miners be disincentivized to continue mining? And the answer is no, because transaction fees will become the only source of revenue for miners. Um, and the conjecture right now is that transaction fees are going to continue to increase until we hit that block reward of zero, um, and they'll act as the as the only uh, profit for 
minors or at, and only revenue actually. Um, and so how do we estimate exactly how much um, transaction fees to add to each of our transactions? And so there are fee estimation algorithms all over the internet um, and they basically take this history of all of the recent transactions. They use their algorithm to figure out, you know, of those um, transactions, how many of them with this transaction fee were, were included in the block, how many of them were this transaction fee were included in the block, how many of them with this transaction fee were included in the block. In the block. And they can basically tell you um, the number of transactions in each block with these transaction fees. So as you can tell, obviously, if you have a higher um, transaction fee, you're going to be more likely to be added um, into a block and lower and lower and lower and, and so on. And so they group this past transaction data into buckets and a bucket represents a range of transaction fees. And these algorithms will spit out the lowest fee rate bucket where all transactions are confirmed. So it'll tell you if you <laughs> historically, if you use this transaction fee, um, you will never be like you'll never get stuck in the mempool, right? You will always be included in a block. Um, and so that, that's what's gonna give you the lowest fee rate bucket. And that's a transaction fee that you should use to ensure your transaction is put into a block without wasting um, any extra Bitcoin in the process. Um, but of course, fee estimation algorithms aren't perfect. And there's a chance that you can use the algorithm, um, use exactly the bucket that they tell you and your Transactions still get stuck in the mempool simply because everyone else that day decided to use a slightly higher transaction fee and yours just got stuck somewhere. And so sometimes we're going to need to bump up the transaction of an already broadcast transaction. So something that I already sent, now I need to say, hey, remember me, like I will give you a little more money, please include me in your next block. And so we only use this when the transaction gets stuck in the mempool. This is kind of an edge case, but we still want to go over it because it's still important. Um, and this is if the fee associated with the, tra the transaction is too low and no miner is going to pick it up. Um, and so this can be caused by a fee estimation algorithm that you know wasn't the most precise or you know a spike in fees. There's a ton of things that um, can cause this. And so there's two different things that we can do to bump up our previous transactions. This first one is called replace by fee in which the user who sent the transaction signs a replacement transaction with the same inputs, the same UTXOs that they sent into the transaction, but now they're gonna pay more transaction fees um, on top of that. And so, like I said, it's gonna come from a change in output because transaction fees equals inputs minus outputs. So if you're using the same inputs, then you have to decrease the output. Um, and so this transaction will have a higher likelihood of getting picked up because you're increasing the transaction fee. Um, the second one, child pays for parent. Um, and it's an interesting name for this, but it's basically just referring to the fact that you're using um, the same one or more of the same outputs from the previous transaction that's stuck. Um, and you're going to create a new transaction with those outputs. And so you're going to attach a large fee to this transaction. Um, and the reason this works is because miners package um, ancestor transactions with um, with new transactions. And so that's kind of like the child is going to pay for the parent because this new transaction is going to grab that parent out of the mempool and say, hey, you're coming with me because we're going to be packaged together and my transaction fee is higher than yours. Um, an important note, though, is that for this second solution, you need to have had at least one output pointed back towards yourself. Um, so like I said, if uh, when we went over this in the first lecture, if I have five Bitcoin and I, and I owe <laughs> if I owe Nate four Bitcoin for the three Teslas he bought me last week, um, I'm going to send him four Bitcoin and then I don't need to send him five, but I only have a UTXO with five in it right now. So I'll send one back to myself. And so that's an example of an output that's getting sent back to myself. And so in that transaction, let's say that transaction gets stuck in the mempool, I can um, say actually from that output that I just sent to myself, I actually cut it down to 0.8 Bitcoin. And so I'm gonna, that, that'll be an additional point too in transaction fees that I'll be giving um, to the miner. And so they'll, they'll be incentivized to include that transaction, that child transaction um, and grab the parent one on the way. Cool. Any questions? <laughs> Hi, uh, I had a question real quick. Um, I think a couple lectures ago, you mentioned that uh, blocks get mined at, at a rate of about one every 10 minutes. So as like traffic speeds up, does that mean that 
transactions are getting slower or blocks are getting larger? Um, blocks are not getting larger. Um, so it could mean that transactions are getting slower if more people are submitting transactions to the network um, since that this space inside of a block is going to stay constant. Yeah, Philomena. Hi, I have a super general question. So my yeah. understanding of blocks within blockchain is that they hold like transactions. Um, so I'm confused, like if you're mining a block, like is it specific to like if I'm mining a Bitcoin block versus if I'm mining a, a block for a different currency? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. So, um, sorry, my computer's about to die. So I'm plug it in. Um, yeah. So different currencies will have different blockchains that they're going to be building on top of. So right now we're referring directly to the Bitcoin blockchain, but all currencies function super similarly. Um, and so we introduced Bitcoin because it was the pioneer uh, cryptocurrency um, using blockchain technology. Um, but yeah, each, each currency will have their own blockchain with a similar protocol. Oh, I have a question. So like, like you, you mentioned, like, uh, if like, when the more people like the more coins are mined, like the last value it has. So like, um, will there be like a point where we're like, like the, the cost benefit will like flip that it might be like no longer profitable uh, for people to mine? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. That's something that I think a lot of people are wondering, you know, like, but I think that I think the answer is is no. The, the profit will continue to incentivize miners even after the block reward is gone, just because as long as there's a demand to use the Bitcoin network, um, and people who are submitting transactions are willing to pay a little bit extra transaction fees to have those transactions um, included on Bitcoin, then the miners will continue to make a profit and the network will continue to function as it has been. But it really just comes down to what will happen to transaction fees, since that will be the sole source of revenue for miners. If that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, of course. Any more questions? We're kind of zooming through this lecture. Um, okay, okay, I'm assuming there's some more questions. So I'm going to move on. Um, but yeah, I think that there'll be one more spot for questions after this. Uh, okay, cool. So at this point, we've gone over the mining revenue, but we haven't gone over that second term for mining costs. Um, and so now we'll, we'll get into some of those fixed costs uh, that miners have to face. Um, so there's a hardware cost because all this mining is being done. Um, like we said, using computational power. And so uh, they need to purchase the hardware in order to execute all the, all the functions of, of mining Bitcoin. Um, so this first one, CPU, um, is like the, also the pioneer hardware. This is what Satoshi <coughs> directly references in the Bitcoin white paper, one CPU, one vote. Uh, that, was, that was the vision for Bitcoin, um, as we can see the hardware has developed a lot further than just CPUs, um, but this would take 7,600,020,101 years to mine a single block, um, just probability wise, if you were to use a CPU to try to um, find the nonce uh, on the Bitcoin network. And so, um, you know, people turn to, to more in intense hardware to try to mine Bitcoin. Um, GPU is an order of magnitude um, faster than a CPU. It's 200 million hashes per second, which is re references how many times um, the GPU can run that SHA-256 algorithm on a random number and try to get that target nonce. Um, it can do this 200 million times per second. 
This is a larger consumption of energy and higher production of heat than a CPU. Um, this was super common in 2012 um, before you know, FPGA and ASICs, but there were a lot of disadvantages. Um, GPUs weren't specific enough to mining and they weren't really meant to be run in farms as mining farms became more of a thing um, side by side each other. And then this also, um, since it's an order of magnitude faster than a CPU, it's gonna take 762,000 years to mine a block, um, which sounds like a long, long time, but it's still faster than CPU. And then we move on to FPGA, which stands for Peeled Pro Field Programmable Gate Arrays. Um, and this is when we start to see actually Bitcoin specific hardware being developed um, without losing all customizability. This isn't exclusively Bitcoin, but this is when um, hardware more tailored towards mining started to uh, be developed. Um, and you get a little bit of a trade-off between just dedicated SHA-256 um, algorithms, which is what we see in an ASIC, which is exclusively meant to be to just run SHA-256, which is why it's so fast, but it also can literally do nothing else, um, and general purpose hardware. So there's this trade-off. Um, if Bitcoin falls, then SHA-256 um, will specific hardware will become worthless like an ASIC, but if Bitcoin thrives, then that specialized hardware is going to get you further and is gonna generate a higher profit. Um, and so this is the final um, hardware that we've seen um, in, the, in the mining space. This, is, this stands for application specific integrated circuit. Um, this does nothing but SHA-256. It's gonna hash 14 trillion times per second, um, which when you compare that to 20 million is just a crazy high number. Um, and it does it better than anything else. It's a huge, there's a huge variety of ASICs with various trade-offs. In general though, there's a lower base cost and lower electricity usage. Um, it's pretty small. I'll show you a picture of it in a mining farm, um, but it's decently compact um, with a higher hash rate, but it can get pretty expensive. So an Antminer S9 is $1,500. So this is definitely like what we refer to when we say, um, you have to be dedicated to the network. This is your fixed cost. Um, if you actually want to get serious about mining Bitcoin, um, that's the price tag on an ASIC. Um, and then we'll get into variable costs, which is the second part. Um, and we'll think about the different types of energy that we consume when we're mining Bitcoin. Um, we have the embodied energy, which is kind of wrapped up inside purchasing that hardware because it was used to produce your hardware. And then we have electricity, which is what we use to power your hardware and then cooling to maintain your hardware. So if you've ever seen giant mining farms, like you might've seen pictures of fans and kind of been like, well, what are fans doing in there? Um, and they're basically, it's kind of like, I don't know if you can hear, but the fan on my computer is kind of going crazy right now. Um, same idea, right? Like we need to cool down that hardware because if you use it, um, too much, like it might just it just break down. So you got to cool that hardware to maintain it. Um, you might even need infrastructure, like warehouses if you're running a mining farm, personnel to execute like all this hardware for you. Um, and, you know, and like all that energy gets converted to heat. Um, and so there's a lot of energy that's being consumed here. And this is kind of why we need that, um, why we need these fans there. Um, and so that's where we derive the, the mining costs from with fixed costs and variable costs. Um, and so we need to ensure, you know, let's say we're putting our heads into the uh, mindset of a miner in this network. We want those block rewards and transaction fees to be higher than those fixed costs and variable costs. Otherwise, we're not, <coughs> we're not receiving a profit and we're not going to continue to mine on the network. Okay, any questions on that? Where can I get an A6 machine? How much does one cost? Um, I think that you can, there are companies that sell it. Um, I've never tried to purchase one myself. I don't know, has anyone on this call tried to purchase an A6? No. Um, Guess I gotta Google it. I know, uh, yeah, I know there's a company called Bitmain that's behind a lot of the major uh, Bitcoin specific hardware. Um, 
but yeah, I, I would just recommend Googling it if you're serious about getting an ASIC. I can't say I'd recommend it though, um, just because of how big mining farms and mining pools have gotten. Um, it's pretty unlikely that you're gonna get the next block, but you can always try. Um, is the Bitcoin network ever gonna be able to allow more transactions per second than it is right now? Um, like technically, if, if every single person on the Bitcoin network decided to um, create a change and create a fork on that blockchain, um, and one of those forks um, continued um, with like the, the original use of, of Bitcoin and one of those forks decided to increase block size um, or, you know, do something different to increase the transaction, um, the frequency of transactions, it's technically possible. Um, but I'm going to say no, just because I don't really think that that's feasible while it is possible. Um, just because like right now, the way that, that Bitcoin is, is um, running, the size of the blocks are not going to change um you know you're not you're not going to change anything that's going to change the frequency of transactions um it, it really just depends on on how many transactions are going through at that moment okay sweet so as bitcoin becomes more adopted it's, there's gonna be a lot more uh transactions going on so the prices or the fees will technically technically go up pretty significantly right yeah and there there are things that we can do to to change that um We'll go over this um, in more depth, but layer one versus layer two solutions um, to scalability. Like we have a whole lecture just on Bitcoin scalability um, that tries to answer this question of like transactions are so slow on the network right now. Uh, how are we going to be like get this adopted by enough people? Um, and so there there are things that we can do, but it would require like a a network wide change, which would be pretty difficult just given how widespread it is. But that's a good question. And I want you to remember that question when we do scalability. Okay, sweet, thank you. Yeah, of course. Sorry, I have another question. Yeah, no, don't be sorry. Um, what is the, is there any intrinsic value in finding the block? Or is it just that once you find the block, you're gonna get like the six Bitcoin or whatever it was? That's an interesting question. Like is finding the block like is that block gonna have any value for you yeah i guess like really my question is i'm still kind of confused on like what just a block is really i just looked it up and it said the list of transactions so i'm wondering like if it wasn't like you'd get bitcoin for finding the block would it still be valuable just to have an added block to your chain or yeah no interesting um I would say, I, I mean, it depends on how you, how you define value. Like maybe some people <laughs> would describe that as, as something valuable, a valuable asset, but no, I don't think like there would be any monetary value to that. Um, I think we can, we think about blocks as um, just, it is like a, it is like a database, you know, like at its core, a blockchain is a database. Um, and so blocks are the units of that database. And in each block, we're storing transactions um so you can think about it as a ledger i guess a block is literally just like gonna have a list of of those transactions um so valuable to some but i don't think that you could sell it for any sort of real value um the the money comes from having your name attached to one of those transactions on that block which comes from the block reward or you know getting getting bitcoin sent to you that answers your question <laughs> Yeah, cool. Awesome. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on then. Okay, so what does mining look like in the real world? Um, <laughs> you may have seen some of these photos before. Um, this is what a mining farm looks like. Um, it, they, this on the left right here with those like different wires attached to it, those are ASICs. So it's super expensive. Um, and it's literally just mining Bitcoin. That's all it's doing. Uh, and so each of those, you know, can cost around $1,500. Um, and they're all trying to 
to find that next block. Um, on the right, we can see different types of cooling mechanisms. This is trying to do water cooling. This is fans. So <laughs> you want to like increase the longevity of your hardware. You want to be able to maintain it for a long time and, and have that mining be sustainable, then you need to, to have these effective ways of cooling. Um, these are the different types of, you know, machines that we're going to use. This is the, the power supply for an ASIC. This is, this is it up close. Um, you can just see like the different types of hardware and what it looks like in real life. Um, if you ever want to interact with it. Um, and so like I referred to, um, the question with about how to purchase an ASIC. And I said, with the prevalence of mining pools and mining farms, it's not the most advisable decision to just like pick up an ASIC for $2,000 and decide to start mining just because probability wise, you're not gonna find the next block. Um, unless like, let's say you, you gather in a mining pool um, and a mining pool is a reference to individual miners who combine or pool their computational power together because they realize like, the probability that I'm gonna find the next block, not super likely. The probability that these 100 people are gonna find the next block, more likely. The, prob the probability that these 500 people, 1000 people are gonna find the next block, pretty likely, you know? Um, and it's all a factor of just how much computational power that there is in the network and your proportion compared to that. So the bigger your mining pool gets, the bigger the proportion of hash power you have compared to the network, and then the more likely you are to mine the next block. Um, and so this is this is preferable to some because while you won't get the full 6.25 Bitcoin, if you find the next block, you'll at least get a portion of it. Um, and if and if you're just doing it on your own, um, you're probably not going to get any of it. And so it reduces um, variance and mining rewards. Um, and it's usually run by a single pool manager or pool operator. So there is a centralized aspect to it. Um, if you've got that tone from like what a mining pool sounds like, it's a little bit centralized. It's kind of straying from the original um, image of a Bitcoin network in which one CPU equals one vote and every single person um, is competing to find that next block. Um, it's, it's a centralized version of that. The pool manager will usually take a cut of the mining rewards. Um, and so if we look at this, we can look at the hash rate distribution estimation among largest, the largest mining pools. And so this portion is kind of just like, you know, people, normal people, whoever, or maybe mining pools that, that we don't know of. Um, but there's some, a pretty big chunk taken by these big mining pools um, that we can see here. And so uh, it's becoming more and more prevalent um, every day. Okay, questions on that. Okay, um, then that's the end of the lecture. Um, I'll stop my screen share. Oh, you guys can go chat. ahead. Oh, do you want me to read it? Yeah, can you read it? Sorry. Because why won't everyone form a single organization of mining pool so everyone gets money? Um, yeah, that'd be pretty cool. I think <clears throat> people, one, like don't know how to reach out to everyone else. Two, the, the reward per person would be like 0 0.000000001 Bitcoin. Um, and I think people prefer to like just mine in these pools that they like know the people um and trust and can get a, a higher fraction of bitcoin but but yeah i don't know i'm not in one we should we should tell everyone to to start their own pool um should i stop the recording yeah yeah you can go ahead um 